if you agree we can uh, we can start uh, with uh, the session good morning uh, everyone good morning uh, david uh, today we have the pleasure to host this uh, uh, seminar, the European Digital Single Market, with our uh, uh, speaker, Professor uh, David Ramiro Troitino from uh, uh, Tallinn. Eh? Uh, Professor uh, uh, Ramiro Troitino is a Jean Monnet Chair on Digital Europe and Twitter Integration and is Senior Researcher uh, on EU Politics at Tallinn University of Technology. Mm, this is uh, uh, an habit that we have uh, in, uh, in, uh, in this part of the year, um, thanks to the European Center, the BASIS, eh? Barcelona Center for European Studies, that uh, 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 allows us to, to host this, uh, uh, this conference that uh, uh, belongs to our core, that is governance and public policy challenges and opportunities within the European Union. Uh, the, 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 section, the, the session will uh, uh, work as it follows. I will briefly present uh, uh, Professor Ramiro Tredinho or, or backgrounds, two, two minutes, then uh, Professor Ramiro Tredinho will give his uh, 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 lecture and at the end uh, we will have the uh, possibility to interchange uh, some uh, uh, comments uh, through a question and answer uh, uh, session. Regarding uh, um, Professor uh, Ramiro Tretino oh, background, here I have entered uh, your webpage, David, on, uh, at uh, Tallinn uh, University. Uh, Professor uh, Tretino old uh, uh, um, BA studies in social history, uh, and then a PhD on uh, uh, European Union studies uh, by the University of Salamanca, Spain. Uh, then he got uh, a, a BA studies in business administration at Tallinn University of Technology uh, in 2013. And just uh, uh, we were uh, uh, interchanged some uh, 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 some words. Uh, it's 20 years that Professor Ramiro Tretino is uh, is working in uh, uh, in uh, in Estonia, where he's also specialize in uh, 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 formation technology and science of engineering uh, regarding uh, regarding the uh, the areas of uh, uh, research uh, basically you told me that you start with social history and the, the, the history of uh, the integration process and then you move uh, more recently uh, on uh, 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 digitalization and the challenges and the opportunities that uh, uh, digitalization can uh, 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 have on the process of uh, 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 European integration. Interestingly, here I have just uh, entered uh, uh, some of the last, uh, uh, the most updated uh, uh, publication by uh, Professor Ramiro Tritino, and here uh, we have one on Brexit, uh, all published with uh, with great uh, uh, publisher like Springer. Brexit, then the EU in uh, uh, the 21st century, and uh, curiously, you have a subtitle that is uh, very similar to the subtitle of our uh, of our course: challenges and opportunity for the European integration process. And finally, uh, the most recent publication: the European Union and its political uh, leaders that are available on, uh, on uh, Amazon and different uh, uh, platforms. So, oh, David, many thanks uh, for being with us. It's a pleasure to host uh, you with, uh, within our course and uh, uh, within uh, BASIS uh, Jean Monnet uh, um, seminar. So the floor is yours. Many thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. For me, it's also a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, let's start focus on the on the main topic of today. The idea was to speak about the digital single market, but we are going to start from the very beginning because at the end, this is a, a part of a process that we have to understand the whole uh, idea in order to um, fully uh, understand what is going on nowadays with the, with the digital single market. European Union. First, what is European Union? And we can speak about from many different perspectives, but one of the main uh, approaches will be the European Union as a peace system. 
we have wars between France and Germany. We don't want them to fight anymore. So we create a community where they are going to serve. And if we think about the beginning of the European communities with the European coal and steel community, what they said is the market. We create a common market with coal and steel. Why coal and steel? Because it's the, what you needed back then to war. Steel to make weapons, coal to as a main source of energy back then, not anymore. So how to manage, how to avoid the um, confrontations? Setting the production, setting the market. If you set it, you cannot use it against each other. So basically what we see that our original target is very different, but the, the way to implement it is the market. So market has been crucial since the beginning of the of the European um, um, integration process. Main idea linked with also with uh, politics is that the, back then they were blaming the national state as the main source of conflict in, in Europe. When we have the combination of nation and state, we see that the nation has access to all the productive and the capacities of the state and use it against the, each other. So original idea of the fathers of Europe, especially you know, Spinelli with the federalist approach or uh, Jean Monnet with the neo-functionalist, is to take away these tools from the nation. We don't want to abolish the nations, but we don't want the national state to have full access to the capacities of the state. So what it means, separate the market. We are not the, we are going to separate the economy from the power of the national politicians. Nothing to abolish nations, nothing to against uh, nationalities, but we don't want them to have access to all this um, uh, production capacity because they can use it in a negative way. And this means uh, wars that we have not seen before in Europe. Okay, we have had wars always in Europe, but what we see, First World War, Second World War is industrial wars. We don't want that to happen anymore. So we separate it, we make a common market. Okay, so economy, market, is since the beginning uh, one of the main uh, parts of it, of the European integration. Um, they were before in the, after First World War, we have the League of Nations and the Commission for the, for the Inquiry of the Creation of the European Union, that the Aristide Briand was the head of this commission. And the main idea is the same. We don't want to have more wars in Europe. Let's, use, let's build something together. At the end, what was the most important thing that they tried to do, to do with this commission? Uh, economy, market. The same idea. We say the market, we are going to uh, avoid com conflicts between the member states. In reality, this uh, proposal of the League, League of Nations that uh, never was implemented uh, is focused on the idea of cooperation. So cooperation, basically, that we don't share sovereignty. Integration, we share sovereignty, and even more, we generate or create a new sovereignty that did not exist before. Okay, so this is very important because even nowadays we can see it in the different proposals in Europe. Okay, uh, British always have been for uh, cooperation. Mm, Germany uh, more for integration. France with integration, but always keeping political uh, uh, predominance and so on. So, in the terms of the market, common market, we see how the British created the uh, Free Trade Association uh, with the Treaty of Stockholm in the 50s as an alternative to the common market. And basically, what they had is a custom union agreements that we try to deal uh, economically together, but without losing sovereignty. This is completely different from the proposal of the European Union and the ideas of the fathers of, the, of Europe, especially Jean Monnet, okay? So in that sense, um, what we see, um, the idea of a neo-functionalism, Jean Monnet, um, we are going to build Europe uh, step by step. There, are, there were different proposals, like, for example, I mentioned before Spinelli, the, the creation of a European Federation with the manifesto of, the, of Milan, I think, when he speaks about the creation of a European Federation in already 
1942 or 43, I don't remember exactly. So during the Second World War, blaming the same uh, nation, state, a combination of both, uh, very dangerous. We had to separate that. So we created the European Federation. This was his proposal. Uh, according to Jean Monnet, this idea of uh, neo-functionalism, this is not possible because people is very attached to the nation. Nation is something uh, still very emotional, very important for the people. We don't, uh, we can, we don't have the capacity to separate them from that uh, with uh, creating a federation. There will be no loyalty of the citizens to this uh, federation. So he proposed this uh, spillover effect. And the, he proposed the neo-functionalist neo approach that we are not going to touch uh, politics for the integration of Europe. We are going to integrate Europe step by step and in areas where people do not have an opinion. Uh, areas where people, low politics, they don't care. And this is basically linked with the market. That's why also single um, uh, digital market is very important nowadays. So basically, main idea here is, um, I don't know, the call. We, we started speaking about the first community. We have the European call and still community. Think all of you, what is your opinion about call? Okay, maybe now it's more important, the call and still. Let's say, let's go to the steel because coal, we can have uh, environmental concerns that did, did not exist before when they was, uh, this community was created. But uh, let's say steel, what is your idea, your personal idea about the steel? So I'm sure that 90% of you, or probably 100%, do not have any idea about the steel. I mean, you don't have anything for it, you don't have anything against it. So it's just neutral. Or we create. Um, common market of uh, tables. I don't have any opinion about tables. Tables, they have four legs and there's something you put the computer on or whatever you put on and that's it. But I don't have a strong personal opinion about that. So linked with this idea, we just neo functionalists start creating this uh, uh, market approach. We are going to integrate areas linked with economy that they are not uh, relevant for the uh, people in the sense of uh, opinions. Because remember, opinions are more strong and opinions in many cases are linked with feelings. So they don't have to be rational. I have my opinion, my circumstances, and that's it. The idea of that since the beginning is uh, we are going to integrate one area. This area is going to provide the benefits and also is going to generate new necessities that did not exist before. So we had these uh, benefits, people is happy, good, but we have new necessities that did not exist, that we didn't have these problems before. So in order to solve these new problems, we had to go to deeper integration. If we don't solve these problems, the integration collapse. It's not that we can stay at one point, or the, it's like a process. So, you, or you go or you just disappear. So, in that sense, as the integration provides us benefits, we are more willing to go ahead to have more profits and keep the profits that we already uh, obtain. So, at the end, this is a gradual process that from this small part where we are integrating uh, steel, that nobody cares about the steel, nobody has an opinion about it, we can reach the common currency, the euro, okay? So we integrate the steel, then what happened with the with that? Bust in the production, we have a economic uh, development, we have a common rules, but we just have common rules on steel. But states or member states can um, um, bend the, the rules with other policies, for example, transport policy. You make um, uh, subsidies for your companies working on steel that they don't have to pay the transportation. So this means that uh, economically they have uh, an advantage to the other companies of the other member states. So this is destroying the integration that we have created before. It's a new problem that we didn't have before. So what will be the next logical step? Integrate the transport policy so that the states do not use it against each other in order to get advantage in the market. 
I like this. We start here. We go. We go. We go. We go until we have a full integration. I mean, at least this is the these ideas of uh, Jamonet. So, following these ideas, we start with the European colonial community. We in the fifties there were other circumstances around the rural area in Germany, the role of United States, the war of Korea. All important, but the main idea is what I say you create a peace system where the Germans and French are going to share. Then we have Italians and the Benelux also in, involved in the process since the beginning, but the central point is France and Germany. Uh, after that, next logical step uh, is to create this uh, European common market. Okay, the European common market that was created in the, with the Treaty of Rome, so based on four freedoms. Free, free movement of goods, free movement of services, free movement of people, and free movement of uh, capital. So this is a big step. We are going to create a common market with common rules for all the member states. Um, in reality, what it was, it was not really fully implemented. And we have just a free movement of industrial goods. So in, we really had an industrial um, a common market in, in Europe. But uh, we still had a lot of uh, national obstacles, national obstacles that uh, were in blocking or uh, affecting the trade, were affecting the common market in Europe. I mean, there are many examples, and all these national um, obstacles are based in, the, in different perceptions about the, the legislation or even traditions. One of the main examples that is used is this uh, Cassis de Dijon, sorry for the pronunciation in French, well, even in English, sorry. But anyway, uh, Cassis de Dijon is a drink in France. So uh, this drink uh, in France was legal, I mean, it's legal, but it has a, a very low percent of alcohol. So according to the French legislation, it's a normal drink, legal drink. So they try to export it to uh, Germany. So in Germany, what they had is a legislation that alcoholic drinks, uh, they have to have a minimum uh, percent of alcohol. So this case the Dijon did not reach this minimum percent of alcohol. So it was illegal in Germany. So this is a clear example of the different national barriers to trade. I mean, it's not a discrimination because in Germany always was this uh, legislation, but it's affecting trade. So at the end, what happened? Because the Dijon, they, they went to the uh, Court of Justice in the, of the European Union. And this is what makes different the market of the European Union to other uh, associations like Mercosur, for example. So European Union judicial system has the is over the national law. So basically what they decided is going to be accepted by the member states. So they cannot change that. They cannot say that the national legislation is different and the national le legislation prevails over this um, uh, market legislation. So in that sense, they went to the Court of Justice. And in the case of Cassius de Dijon, we had the, the Court of Justice say that, yes, it's uh, we had to respect the national uh, uh, traditions of Germany, where all the drinks, alcoholic drinks, have to have a minimum uh, uh, level of alcohol, but uh, with a less restrictive uh, approach, which means that uh, you can force Cassius de Dijon to put in big letters in the label, this has less alcohol than traditionally. Okay, so yes, you are making a, an obstacle to trade because they have to make a new label, but you cannot just forbid trade. So anyway, it's just an example. There are many, many examples affecting the free movement of uh, services and the free movement of people. In free movement of people, the first one that comes to my to my head is the um, a woman, Portuguese woman, that was uh, working in the social link with free movement of people, that was working in the was living in France, but was not working or doing any economic act, any economic activity. Remember that before Schengen, free movement of people was linked with the market. So it was not absolute free movement of people for everybody. I mean, the students, there were some different uh, directives, but mainly was the market. What happened there? Uh, the woman was not doing any economic ac activity. But the French authorities uh, tried to send this woman back to Portugal. And this woman went to the Court of Justice and said that uh, she was providing a service because she was cleaning in a church. So... But the French authorities said that 
what service is that because you are not getting any money. And uh, in her defense, she said that uh, she was getting a spiritual uh, reward, okay? That uh, God and all this stuff, uh, I mean, she was feeling um, paid by the uh, spiritually. And the Court of Justice accepted that. So basically what it means that the, what we have seen with the, with the market and with these four freedoms of the market is a big um, uh, development of the integration of Europe because almost everything can be linked with the market. We live in a society nowadays, uh, I mean, let's be realistic, uh, our society is linked with money. The way to measure success in our society is uh, through money. I mean, most of you, for sure, are really young and you still don't understand it and you have a lot of ideas. I also had, and I, I hope I have some still left, but uh, with the age, you start understanding that really everything is measured with money at the end. So good, but this is up to you to decide. Uh, it's up to you to change, okay? Uh, you are young and uh, full of ideas, so try to change the world to a better place. I already tried, and I think I'm tired already of trying, but anyway, this is... Uh, Everybody is different. But the point here is that the, if almost everything can be measured with money, almost everything can be included in the market. So almost everything can be part of this uh, European integration. So basically what we had here, and that's why I wanted to speak a, a lot about that, even when we are going to speak later about the digital single market, is the capacity of the market for uh, generating deeper integration in Europe. Hmm. Sorry, whatever field, almost whatever field you think about, we can include it in the market. So imagine now in the digital market, uh, it's the new world, new possibilities. I mean, new world uh, in brackets because it's, it's already here, it's already a reality, but we have not uh, still use it or develop it. So making it European, one of the main consequences will be that we will uh, accelerate the European integration. Because as I say to you, something very simple is nothing that is so complicated. Uh, market, court of justice, national barriers, states cannot stop integration because they already accept the supremacy of the European Union law. Okay, so once you accept the, uh, or you include in the treaties, the digital market, all the aspects related with that, that are many, can be included in the European integration, even if they are not as explicitly included in the in the treaties. Okay, so and after the common market, so bas <coughs> sorry, basically what we had, uh, as I said, we had the um, uh, industrial and the um, uh, agricultural. I didn't mention the agricultural part. One important part of the market was the uh, agricultural products with a common agricultural policy. And it makes a, some kind of distortion between in the market because uh, in economy it was, uh, let's say, uh, liberal, abolish as much uh, uh, barriers as possible. With the, with the agricultural aspect, we see the opposite, uh, creating more barriers and more barriers in order to protect the European farmers. We don't want the European farmers to disappear, so we, I, mean, I will not go too much into it because this common agricultural policy we could be like uh, weeks just uh, speaking about it. At the moment, it's changing very much. Okay, we had the last reforms that is opening the agricultural market and providing benefits to farmers uh, through other uh, options. Okay, not just uh, the production and it was uh, originally created. Anyway, this common market was working good in some aspect, but was not fully implemented. So we need to make a big reform in order to have a real, real market. So what happened? And this is always the same. Okay? European Union will never accept the, that they have failed on something or that something is not then fully implemented or is not uh, working uh, perfect. So they just rename it. They make a new brand and they call it single market. We had the single market in the 86. So the idea is exactly the same than the common market. Nothing changed, but there is Common market, but we are going to really achieve it, make bigger reforms and try to uh, make it work better. But remember that the, with the European Union, in many cases, they never accept these failures and they just change the names. So and what is the difference between common market and single market? 
not many. Okay, yes, there are differences in the sense that the single market tries to make the common market work good. It's like a European constitution. I think, I guess all of, most of you will remember this European constitution that the French and the uh, Netherlands uh, rejected. So what we do now, mm, there's so many things there that we need for the working system of the European Union. We had two options here. It's like to ask the French again, that they vote again, as we have done with the Irish, as we have done with the Danish. Okay, so we make a new referendum, basically saying, um, I ask you again because uh, you did not choose uh, properly the first time, so I give you a second chance. This is really what we did with the with the some states, but it's France. So it's a big state. It's the most important state, member state of the European Union with Germany. So we cannot do that. So what they did, they changed the name and they call it Treaty of Lisbon. And the content is really, really similar. I mean, they're very, very small uh, differences, but they just changed the name. They don't say the new European constitution or the European constitution reform. They just, okay, constitution is something linked with federal approach. <coughs> it's something linked with the federal, with the European state. I mean, we associate in our brains constitution with the state. So let's just change the name. Um, Treaty of Lisbon. Everybody happy. We have the Treaty of Lisbon approved. So, <coughs> <coughs> sorry. We have the same with the single market and the common market. It's the same idea, but we just say uh, change the name. Um, still nowadays with the normal market, I mean the market of the European Union is what is the most important market in the in the world, more than the Chinese, more than the American, North American. So it's a market that is working good. It's a market that is generating a lot of wealth. It's a market that uh, has a big impact in the in the world in terms of uh, trade, but it still has uh, problems that or is not fully integrated. And these problems that we will have to face with the digital market as well, okay? And this part, this uh, obstacles or barriers that we still have with the European market, we will have also with the digital market. And that's why this is, is important that we understand them, okay? So first um, problem or barrier that we have with the European market, uh, national, different national tax systems. The taxes, are going to affect the productivity of the companies. So you can play as an state with this productivity of the companies in order to support your national production. States try to do it constantly. Okay, it's a part of the game. So, but we had to try to reduce the possibilities as much as possible in order to have a real uh, competitive European market. So, I mean, the tax system is. It's really complicated. I see it's very difficult that we will ever have a common tax system. I mean, I work uh, in Estonia, in Tal Tech University, Tal Technical uh, University, and I also work in, uh, in Turku University in Finland. So in Finland, uh, you pay much more taxes than in, than in Estonia. In Estonia, it's very small percent comparing with Finland. But of course, the social services that the Finland is providing is are much higher than the social services that I get in in Estonia. So, what would you do? I mean, you cannot just say to the Estonians you are going to pay as as much taxes as the Finnish, because first of all, they will require a lot of time to get the same social services, and second of all, they don't want because they prefer to have a better economic performance. It's an state that comes from the Soviet Union that they has suffered a huge uh, economic transformation. So they need to increase the productivity. They finish, they come from a different background. The economy already somehow is uh, productive, but with these minuses. If you ever want to upset a uh, Finnish in terms of economy, speak with them about Nokia. They always get sad and it's like, for them, Nokia is like a big national failure. Okay, so it's like, uh, they have their ups and downs also, the, the Finnish. They had a big crisis after the Soviet Union also, because their main market, or the, one of the main markets of the Finnish economy was the Soviet Union, and suddenly it, is, it collapsed. So anyway, 
very complicated. The other way around, ask uh, the Finnish that they are going to pay much less taxes following the Estonian model. Mm, yeah, maybe at the beginning they will be happy. But then you are saying that you are not going to get almost pensions. You are not going to get uh, unemployed payment uh, and so on and so on and so on. So they will be very unhappy. So in that sense, to have a full integrated market, we should have a common taxes, but uh, at the moment it's not uh, possible. If we think about social systems, we have four different social systems in, in Europe, main groups. That would be the Nordic, the continental, the Mediterranean, and the Anglo-Saxon. Anglo-Saxon even still with uh, Ireland and uh, other states that follow that, uh, that model. Estonia will put it more in the Anglo-Saxon uh, social system anyway. So basically what we have is different groups, different uh, way to approach to these taxes, but these taxes are uh, affecting the market. So this will happen the same with the digital market. Mm, it's happening here now in Estonia. Uh, just a stupid example, but an example that can solve, I mean, or in Spain, think about all these YouTubers that are moving to Andorra. Even Andorra is not part of the European Union, but they move there because they don't pay taxes or they pay much less taxes. We have the same with, uh, within the European Union with Estonia. All this, uh, there is a lot of uh, people here. I, I mean, it's a small place, so at the end you meet uh, almost everybody. There are, for example, a lot of uh, people from Spain playing poker. They play, they play poker online. And for in Estonia, for all the re revenues that you have from outside Estonia, uh, online, you don't pay any taxes. So these people is playing online. Basically, they are playing uh, with uh, people from the United States because it's the main market of, the, of poker. I, I don't know how to play poker. I have never played. It's just what they say to me, OK? So basically, uh, all this revenue that they are getting, they don't pay any taxes in Estonia. So this is affecting the competitiveness of the European market in the sense that all these players are moving to Estonia. Okay, so we have this digital uh, residency, but in that sense, uh, do not apply here. But we have many different aspects that Estonia is trying to uh, get advantage of the digital uh, uh, economy. So, what is the solution in the short or medium term for this uh, issue of the taxes? Um, in my opinion, it should be like the, um, the, the environment or when uh, environmental policy started. Minimum standards in the European Union. So we are going to have this minimum uh, tax uh, percent or level in the all European Union. And then we allowed each member state to have more than that. But we will have, uh, we need to have this minimum because otherwise we see the things that happen like, uh, like nowadays with the, especially with the digital economy and uh, countries like uh, my, my second country, Estonia, uh, with, the, with the taxes. Okay, so Estonia trying to uh, foster this more digital development, is trying to attract all this talent, not just uh, poker players. This was just a stupid example that you understand it, but uh, many developers, many. Uh, Startup companies. Okay, so Estonia, I think, is one of the countries of Europe with more startups. Here is everybody is working with some startup. That's why also prices are creating crazy here in Tallinn. It's uh, one of the countries of Europe with the highest inflation and the big salaries coming from these uh, high tech uh, companies. Okay, startups. The way to attract them, one of way to attract these companies is uh, taxes. The same we have with uh, Ireland. Think about the Ireland, why Google or Microsoft is in Ireland, are in Ireland. I mean, one reason, of course, is the language, English. So these are American companies, they, but they are multinationals. They are companies that are global. So they don't care so much about the language. So they are in Ireland because they pay less taxes. And the market is not the Irish market. The market is the European market. Okay, so we have there uh, this functionality because you pay taxes in a member state, but you get your income in the European level. Okay, so a problem that needs to be addressed. A problem that we have in the traditional market, European uh, single market, and a problem that we will have. And we already are having even before we had this uh, digital single market. So it will be important to uh, see it beforehand to try to make some uh, actions in that, uh, in that field. 
Uh, we still have in the traditional market separate markets for financial service, uh, services, energy, and transport. Okay, so financial services at the end is linked with this uh, this idea of the taxes. Free movement of capitals. We don't have really free movement of capitals. If we have free movement of capitals, what it means that everybody can move the money and you pay the taxes where you have the money. So if full uh, free movement of capitals, everybody, um, not me because I'm a teacher, so I don't get paid. So I, I don't complain. I'm fine with my salary, but uh, I'm not rich. They say, I mean, 100%, I say. So I don't have money to send to Luxembourg. But if I will have the money yeah, and I have the possibility, because most of the people will send the money to Luxembourg because it's legal, it will be legal, free movement of capitals, and I will pay much less taxes. Okay, then uh, comes your social conscious, uh, the, that you get what you get back, and the and services from the state and the social uh, solidarity, but the, this is about person, uh, personal beliefs. So most of the people will care about the saving money. So, it's a very logical movement that most of the people will send all the money to, for example, Luxembourg. How are we going to have these financial uh, digital services if we have the same problem in the traditional uh, market? I mean, if we really have, uh, think, uh, many companies that are linked with uh, financial services within the European Union, that uh, their main uh, customers are uh, online. So, this movement of uh, money or financial services is creating a, a distortion in the market that we need to address already. Uh, I put you an example of a company here in Estonia. There is a, a company in Estonia, I will not say the, the name, but it's an Italian company. All the people working in the company are Italians. Okay, so they are all located in Tallinn, in Estonia. And the company, I don't know, I think there are like 40, 50 people, all of them Italians, living in Estonia, uh, providing um, financial services with uh, um, uh, bitcoins and all these uh, currencies. And they just work with Italy. So that's why they are all Italians. But why they are in Estonia? Because they pay much less taxes in Estonia than being in Italy. So this is a distortion in the in the market. Okay, uh, we have a movement of uh, money that somehow will be I don't know the specifics at all, but I guess will be difficult for the Italian state to control also. Okay, so we are creating a situation where we have a company that are just Italians located all in Estonia dealing with the Italian market. Okay, so this cannot last forever because this is a distortion that is affecting the, the productivity of the system and it's affecting the productivity, for, let's say, for example, of Italy. Italy, because it's Italians it working in Italy, but located in Estonia. Italy is losing a lot of money there in terms of uh, taxes. It's legal. Okay, I'm not complaining about this company. They are taking advantage of the, of the system to be more productive. It's legal. There is not a problem. But we have to correct this kind of uh, situations in the digital uh, digital market. Okay, uh, we have uh, <coughs> problems also with the recognition of the uh, vocational uh, qualifications. In order to have free movement of people, we should accept in the whole European Union uh, uh, vocational studies. Within the terms of universities, I mean, free movement of people is free movement of workers. So when I came to Estonia they, to work here, they asked for my, I had a master. I didn't have a PhD still when I, when I moved to Estonia. I came here with a master and uh, finishing already, um, or doing already my PhD. I finished the courses, I was just writing it. So I could write it in Estonia. Uh, the point is that they accepted my, my degree, no problem. So I started working here in the University of uh, Tartu. So basically what it means that they accept this uh, my education and my qualification as a worker. So next step on that is vocational studies. That there we have much more problems that because with the university, the process in Bologna and so on, we have a, a convergence in Europe. But now we are uh, we want to specialize more in these vocational works. The same will happen with the digital market. Remember all these uh, ideas linked with the uh, high tech, all these works linked with high tech. 
that many states do not accept the uh, titles from other states because they are not university studies in many cases. Okay. In Estonia, we have a, a strong system with vocational uh, studies linked with uh, technology. So you don't have to be in the university in order to, to uh, get qualification in, in, in that field. I don't know how is the system anymore in, in Spain because I, I move away. I mean, I study a long, long time ago, but it was like the uh, formation prof professional before, or I don't know what it is nowadays. Okay. But it's the same idea. We had to create a common frame in order to uh, foster the mobility in the digital market. And this mobility is not going to be a mobility, physical mobility. In the digital market, what we see that this mobility is going to be online. But we have to uh, accept the qualifications of the other states because the market is going to affect the whole uh, European uh, Union. Okay. So, digital market, more focusing on the, the main point. I mean, I hope you, I was not bothering you so much or too much details about the the where we come from and what it is uh, why it's important for the digital market but now nowadays digital market we have digital economy this is uh, already a fact i mean it's not a, a matter or a waste this digital economy is growing and growing it's becoming more important so the idea is the same let's regulate it we created a com we create a common market. This common market is going to foster the uh, uh, economic uh, exchange. So our economy is going to grow. We are going to be uh, stronger. We are going to be more wealthy, and we are going to be more happy. Okay, remember that we want money. Money is what makes us happy in this uh, life. There are many different aspects that are important uh, in this uh, digital market. The first one I wrote in my notes is protection against uh, big economic actors. Think about the capacity of uh, states to uh, lobby with um, with uh, Google or Microsoft. I mean, what is the capacity of Estonia to force uh, Google to do something? Zero. Okay, Google, they will do whatever they want, even if Estonia says something. The same with Spain. Okay, the same with France. The same with Germany, this important state. Why? Because these states do not have the capacity, but the muscle to uh, force these big companies to do whatever uh, is required in order to accept the rules of the, of the society, contribute to the society, and so on and so on. Mm, example that I always give in this uh, importance of the digital market to have a common digital market is uh, comes from the traditional market. Mm, we had uh, before uh, in the United States, we have two companies, Honeywell and General Electric. They were going to merge and they were going to create the biggest company in the world. Okay, I'm speaking about the final mistake in the 80s or 90s. So before internet and all this stuff. So these two companies were going to create the biggest company in the world. The antitrust authorities in the United States accepted this merge. So it was said, okay, there are some conditions, but we accept that you create just one company. It was uh, Monty, this uh, Italian commissar of the of competence, that they said that, no, we don't want this merge. We will not accept this merge because it will be a monopoly inside of the European Union. So think about the situation. Two companies from the United States, the United States authorities accepting this merge and European Union authorities saying no. So what was the possible outcome? They follow with the, with the merge, they create their company and they work like a single company all over the planet, but they lose access to the European market. So the company was, uh, both companies were uh, measuring the profit and the losses and they decided at the end not to merge because they could not lose access to the European market because the European market is very important, okay? So this is the power of the European market. So we, with our legislation, with our uh, anti-monopoly um, legislation, competition law, we stopped a merge of two American companies, North American companies. So it's something very strong. 
It's like a soft power, but it's still relevant. The same with the digital market. We cannot face with the power of Google. We cannot face the power of uh, Microsoft individually. So basically, we are lost if we don't unite in the digital world. So creating this common digital market, we will create also the uh, institutions. The we will get the tools to force these companies to have a um, sustainable development or the, something that they, they are not going to have a monopoly. They are not going to use the data for their own uh, benefit and so on and so on and so on. Things that we cannot do uh, individually. So that's why one of the reasons that the digital market is very important for the for Europe and the European Union and for you, for the people, okay? So at the moment, these big uh, tech companies basically are controlling China and the United States. There is no other area in the world that they can control them. Not Russia, not the Brazil, not, the, not any other place. So European Union <coughs> should be one of these, um, these uh, powers, okay, to control these uh, big companies. We have, uh, we are starting in the process, we see it with the data protection uh, legislation that we have in, the, in terms of digital aspects in the European Union. But uh, still, we need a, a lot to do. And the main or most effective way to do that will be the uh, digital market. Okay, Common rules, uh, common position. There will not be that uh, Google can play with uh, Spain, uh, France, and uh, Estonia, because it will have to deal with the European Union. Okay, So let's say that United, we are uh, stronger, that we are in individually facing this, uh, these challenges. <clears throat> this reminds me also this uh, this idea that the uh, European Union will rule the 21st century. That was a book uh, published in the beginning of the 20th century by Mark. Uh, I don't remember the family name, but it was very popular back then. Okay, the main idea there was that the uh, link with the European market and link with the uh, international politics. Everybody uh, will follow European legislation because they want to trade with us. So in order to trade with the European Union, you have to follow the standards of the European Union. So basically it's the construction of, of an empire without having an empire. I make the legislation, economic re legislation, how do you have to produce uh, oranges? If you don't produce oranges in the way that I want, you cannot sell your oranges to the European market. Okay, so the power of the market in order to expand uh, your international influence. Uh, it, this did not happen. As you can see, the European Union is not the, the most important force in the in the world. But there is some truth behind this idea. Okay, Our market is still very important. Our legislation that we do ourselves is uh, followed by many parts of the world that they, are, they have economic links with the European Union. They want to trade with Europe. They have to follow these uh, European standards. Okay, that's it. The digital market the same. We have a digital market that now is dominated by American companies. We have a digital market that is with Chinese companies are becoming stronger and stronger. And if we are able to create this digital market and create this common set of rules, and the rest of the planet want to trade with us, that still our power is economic, mainly that they will want to trade with us, they will have to follow these uh, rules that we have in the digital market. So in that sense, it's also important in terms of international uh, politics and international influence. It's like a way of, uh, European Union always tries to make it very, um, let's say philosophical, and the European Union speaks about this topic saying that uh, we want uh, to protect the European way of life and the only way to protect the European way of life is uh, having legislation that respects this um, uh, philosophical approach to life, which includes social system and uh, many different uh, individual freedom and blah, 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 and different, different aspects. So it's the same idea. If we want to protect our way of life, our society, we need to be strong. How to be strong is having a common market, common digital market, okay? The single market. Um, more things, sorry, I'm speaking too much. Uh, uh, mm, digital uh, mm, mm, barriers to stop. Mm. 
Economic import is, is the last thing that we'll say about the why it's relevant to have this the digital market. Is the European Commission estimates that 1.25 trillion uh, euros by 20, 2025 will be the uh, size of the market, the digital market. So if we regulate it good, it's going to provide a um, more stable frame for companies. It means higher development, more capacity of creating these uh, European companies. We have these unicorns and all this stuff, but uh, in reality, what are the main uh, digital companies at the moment? Uh, United States. So if we want to compete, we need to create this common frame and the capacity of the protection of these, uh, these companies. Uh, possibilities that we have nowadays for the digital market. Uh, trust is one of the main uh, concerns now in the, for the European Union, uh, cybersecurity. We need to create a real uh, um, system that is effective, that uh, is going to uh, provide trust to the consumers, to the economic agents, in order to increase the participation in the digital single market. I have the example always the, here of, the, of Estonia. Uh, we had a, we will try to make it very short, we had a, a statue in the city center of Tallinn. It was a statue of a Soviet Union soldier. So for the Russian population that we have in Estonia, that is more or less one third of the population, uh, it was a symbol of freedom, a symbol of the defeat of the Nazis in the Second World War. For the Estonian population, it's a symbol of occupation, uh, Soviet army, army occupying Estonia. So they say that Estonia was liberated by the Soviet army, but uh, without uh, giving any freedom, let's say. So a confrontation between these two groups of the population. The government of Estonia decided to move the, just this statue to the outside of, the, of Tallinn, to a museum, but not to be in the city center in a park, not to destroy it either. But it was a lot, a lot of problems with the Russian population because they thought that they were attacked to them and blah, blah, blah. So basically what we had was a sun revolt. I mean, not... Uh, not uh, so much violence, uh, but uh, for Estonia, yes, because it's a very calm country. Nothing happened here. It's super calm. It's one of the reasons I like to live here. But yeah, some problems. The Russian government made a massive uh, uh, cyber attack on, uh, on Estonia. I remember perfectly, I was in Israel uh, back then in the, in the university in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv, sorry. In the, for two days, my credit card stop working absolutely so imagine that you are in another country and you don't have any money and suddenly you don't have like it's like a big collapse so this is why one of the reasons that it started with this uh, common strategy in europe now we have two different systems two different uh, agencies enisa in, uh, in greece and then the, uh, another one belonging to nato in estonia uh, based on cyber security Cyber security has become a priority in terms of uh, digitalization in the European Union, and it's very important in order to provide security to economic agents. We need the trust of the people. Without the trust of the economic agents, or the people, the consumers, the companies, we will not have a, a real digital single market. Okay, so that's why European Union is investing a lot of money on, on that. Uh, European Union... <coughs> Uh, creating a more economic benefit. We already spoke about it. The European Commission, again, and this big, always very careful because the European Commission always provides very optimist uh, data or uh, previsions. Okay? So the European Commission is saying that we will get 415 billion uh, euros extra each year if we have a digital single market. So that it will force, uh, I mean, we eliminate barriers, we make it easier to have a uh, trade. So we increase the economic uh, activity. But I insist, uh, always be careful. It's also the work of the European Union. Okay, the, Some part of the work of the European Union is to promote deeper integration. European Commission, sorry. Deeper integration. So in that sense, they always give this uh, kind of data. Uh, third aspect is <coughs> European Union to become a digital uh, leader. We already spoke about it. So we have these common rules. These common rules uh, apply to the whole European uh, market. Everybody, or most of the people want to trade with us. They will have to follow our legislation. So this will give us leadership in this uh, 
it will give us the capacity to shape the digital world, okay? Uh, technology and the work, I mean, this is another important part with the digital market is estimated by the European Commission that 40% of the tax of the uh, workers uh, could be done by technology. So this will liberate a big part of the, our time and will, will make our economy, our economic uh, performance much more uh, efficient. Uh, digital market also in relation with education. Uh, <coughs> at the moment, 65%, I'm following this data of the European Commission, 65% of the children uh, entering a school will have a new uh, job in the future that does not exist nowadays, that will be linked with the uh, digital single market. So for you, it will be very important. You are young, you still have to go to the, to the market. Very, very important, will provide you a lot of possibilities, but for next generations, it's going to be really uh, fundamental. So we have to create this frame that this can de develop, okay? Uh, we have a problem in the European market that the, just 7% of the small and medium uh, uh, companies are selling online in another European Union country. So we want to increase that. So how to increase that? Creating a common frame. This makes things easier. Think that one of the main obstacles to have uh, this um, medium and uh, small companies is bureaucracy. If you have to do so many papers, different papers, <coughs> It's going to be a waste of time and uh, you don't have the capacity either. You don't have the one sp specific person that is an expert on these things. So you just don't trade with other uh, member states. In that sense, uh, I just always put the example of Estonia. I mean, Estonia is a very digital uh, state. Bureaucracy almost does not exist here. I mean, uh, I did the income declaration the other day. It took for me like really three minutes. All the data is already in the system. Uh, they already even have my uh, salary from Finland in the system. I didn't have to put anything. So they already had all the information because uh, I already I granted them access. So for me, what they making the income declaration was click, click, click. That's it. Done. Uh, we can vote online. We can, uh, all the paperwork. Uh, you can sell a, a car. And uh, a friend the other day bought a car. They were in a cafeteria. They agreed to I mean, check the car. They agreed. They made the, uh, went to the uh, traffic uh, webpage in Estonia. They went to the section, this uh, buy and sell cars. They agree on that. Then they get a link. Then they have to make the payment. And then they automatically it's already a car in the name of the, of the new buyer. That's it. You do it from the phone. Okay. So it's really simple in that sense. So this, the idea is to expand that to the European Union level. As less bureaucracy as we have, more capacity we have to, uh, to generate economic activity. Link now again with this uh, Italian company. I, I speak about this Italian company that is located here because I have some friends working there. Okay, one, uh, one of my best friends here in Estonia is from Venice, and, well, from Josulu near Venice, and uh, he's working there in this company. So he's telling me, he's telling me that the, to hire someone in, in Estonia, you just need one paper, and this one paper you do it online. And he's saying me that in Italy you need like a, I don't know seven, eight papers and it's different papers, and they, not every, everything online. So which makes much more complicated uh, the access to the market. <laughs> Digital single market will uh, provide us with this common frame will reduce this uh, bureaucracy and we will have, but again, remember, we cannot harmonize everything, but can allow us to introduce these minimum standards. And from these minimum standards, move forward. Okay. <clears throat> um, main, uh, for me, main um, consequence of having a digital single market, I already mentioned it, is like, it's going to increase enormously the integration in the European Union is going to generate uh, problems, it's going to generate the uh, conflicts between member states, between companies, national legislation, and this is going to be solved in the Court of Justice. If we have a common digital market, uh, it's approved, it's included in the treaties, it automatically becomes European. So this is going to lead to much more integration in the close future. 
okay, the integration that is generated by the sentences of the High Court of Justice. So in that sense, it's very important that we adapt to the digital reality to have to adapt the integration to the new world, because the integration of Europe was thought or was designed in the 40s, 50s, 20th century, when there, this, nothing of this existed. So it's not uh, ready for what we have now, for this new transformation that we are having in the society. So we have to adapt the process, otherwise the process will collapse. And I really think, I'm very idealistic in that sense, I really think that the European Union is something very good and is providing us a lot of benefits. And think, for example, about the original uh, target of European Union. Who thinks now possible uh, to have a war between France and Germany? Nobody. So European Union has been very successful in many, in many ways. Many things are not working good. I agree 100%. But that's why we have to reform the system and improve and improve and improve. One of the main improvements is to adapt the system to the reality. We have a new social model, socioeconomic model, that is based on digitalization. And it's not uh, that we are creating this digitalization. It is already there. And if we don't adapt the organization to it, the organization will collapse. Okay? So in that sense, the creation of digital single market is going to <coughs> hmm. is going to foster this uh, integration. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Um, one of the things that, for example, in Estonia, they're very proud of the link with this digital market is roaming. Uh, we, we have a um, European Union, we have a common market, why we had to pay uh, different tariffs when we move uh, from one country to the other. So this was uh, an initiative of the commissar from Estonia, okay, that was a uh, prime minister of Estonia, now is a member of the European Parliament, okay, so basically this uh, guy is the one who started all this uh, movement to abolish the ro roaming in, within the European Union. And now I think everybody likes that, okay. So this is a very simple example how this uh, digitization can help us. New things that are coming now, the, the most uh, important things that are coming now with the uh, digital single market, uh, you blocking regulation, so blocking according to the uh, location. So European Union is trying to work that the location will be European Union, not anymore uh, Spain, uh, France, uh, Estonia. Okay, so approve legislation in order to force all these economic agents to uh, include location European Union. So it makes no difference between uh, different parts of the European Union. This will help a lot for the implementation of the digital single market. And the second uh, main initiative that is uh, nowadays uh, working is this uh, new copyright uh, uh, framework. We need to have a clear uh, copyright uh, legislation in order to protect the intellectual pro uh, property. In a digital world, this is very important. Once it's in the internet, it's very difficult to control that. Okay, so if we have a strong European legislation in that regard, we will uh, avoid conflicts on that. And uh, one of the most important consequences of this uh, digital single market will be the possibilities for e-governance within the European Union. This uh, following this uh, spillover effect that we spoke before about the new functionalism. This digital integration, digital economic integration, is going to generate a lot of benefits, but it's going to generate the necessity to regulate more and more this uh, common market, to abolish the uh, distortions of the market, the malfunctions or the dysfunctions and the different aspects. So this is going to lead to more uh, political integration. The same that the traditional market did. Okay, so it's nothing new. It's not a revolution. It's not something that. It's exactly the same that we had before, but adapt to the digital uh, market. Here, the main uh, aspects are the digital sovereignty. We create a new sovereignty that will be this digital sovereignty in the European Union, digital citizenship. In Estonia, uh, we have already had this digital citizenship, cybersecurity, but we will have to face the institutional uh, obstacles. So basically, <coughs> Institutions uh, in the European Union and uh, in the member states are used to a way of working that this digital revolution will change a lot. Mm, when I speak, uh, I focus, for example, more in the in development of the digital state in Europe. 
in Estonia, sorry. I always mention that the, in Estonia, they had the special circumstances. They were part of the Soviet Union. So they could not use anything from the past. So they had to start a new state. Okay, they could not use any uh, infrastructure or the traditions or bureaucracy coming from the European, from the Soviet Union. So basically what they did, it was a very brave uh, bet on digital uh, services. So we are going to create this digital um, uh, e-governance because we start from zero. We had to build something new. It's much more difficult in countries that they have already their own systems that have been working for many years with the uh, traditions and civil servants uh, used to work in, those, in a specific way. Think about France and the power that the civil servants have in France. It will be very difficult to implement the same uh, level of uh, e-governance in France than in Estonia, okay? Because of these uh, institutional uh, obstacles, let's say. Uh, anyway, this uh, e-governance is much more efficient and transparent. There is no doubt uh, about it. Still, some people say that this, you know, what happens in the, in the internet, I cannot control it and blah, 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 but the cybersecurity is much more effective in, in many cases than the paperwork. Think uh, what is my technological capacity or uh, capabilities to change a paper in a file of papers like this, I change a paper to make some corruption deal with the public uh, services, for example, or public work, it's much easier to change a paper than to go inside of the system and try to uh, change the system in the internet. Okay, so my level of capacity or my capabilities needs to be much higher in the uh, e-governance. So this idea that is weaker, in my opinion, is, is not uh, true. It's much easier to change a paper and it's always insist on that. We also had to face this social resistance to implement this e-governance consequence of the digital market. Okay, the trade unions, the big the companies, lobbies, the diplomats. Diplomats will be very much affected because much of the work of the diplomats can be done in, in internet. Um, I don't know, I mean, I have been 20 years living in Estonia. Uh, I mean, it's not really a complaint, but maybe I have been in the Spanish embassy twice in 20 years. I mean, they don't need to provide me any service I cannot get uh, online from the Estonian state. Just if you lose the passport, but luckily I have not lost the passport in 20 years. So that's it. All these people will be uh, strongly affected by this the digitalization of the services. Okay. Digital gap is another uh, problem that we have. That the part of the population is not uh, used to these uh, digital aspects. And it was in Spain where we had this movement from uh, abuelos and abuelas trying to uh, get services from banks because the banks are becoming uh, digital. So the same, we have to uh, protect this kind of population as an state or uh, as Euro European Union, that is not an state, but it's uh, some kind of political frame. We need to protect the population, okay, also. So we have to take that, all of that into uh, consideration. Uh, more or less, that's, that's all that I have prepared for, for today. I see I have been speaking 10 minutes more than, or 15 minutes more than, than planned, but uh, sorry, and I hope you have million questions now and I will solve all of them happily. Well, many thanks, uh, David, and congratulations, first of all. Uh, I have a couple of pages of notes uh, by myself, but... Uh, uh, I would like to to leave the floor to uh, to, to to the students first, uh, just to I mean to to recall some of uh, of your points, uh, uh, um, just to to make some uh, some sweet transition. Uh, I, I mean I, I think that one of the main idea. Correct me if I'm wrong. I mean is the, is the is the the power of markets has uh, has uh, engine no drivers of of integration. We had historically. The physical market for for goods uh, that really you know enhance uh, uh, integration and is where we 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 really observe how uh, sovereign states uh, uh, converge towards I mean some common decision making uh, uh, system and now we have 
um, digital market, no, that that could uh, could uh, have the same could uh, yeah have the same uh, the same power, no. I mean, a push, a uh, 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 a sort of uh, uh, new uh, emphasis uh, uh, on uh, European integration. My question is. Uh, Given that probably today the European Union is not, uh, uh, I mean, is being challenging by populisms, by uh, the resurgence of uh, nationalisms, etc. Do you think that in the end, uh, digitalization, the urgency of of uh, 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 going digital at the EU level? can be a good uh, uh, asset in the hands of um, Europeans or those that believe that uh, we need the European Union. I, be I, I belong to, to this group of people, eh? uh, just to, to, to make it clear. Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree 100%. I mean, now we have I mean, two things um, regarding the market. From one of the examples, uh, easy examples, uh, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence needs a lot of data, a huge amount of data that they, not a single state can generate alone. For example, in Estonia, artificial intelligence was developed at the beginning, but as Estonia is a very small country, the capacity to collect data is very reduced, so they have been left behind. In the international arena, what happened? If we don't have the single market, uh, there will be no the European legislation on that. They will, we will be uh, very weak. We cannot use this data and. Uh, we will have artificial intelligence based on Chinese or uh, United States model because they have the capacity to to get this data and we don't. So it's another example of this, what you say, this uh, power or size of the market that is going to provide us uh, benefits and it somehow is also going to, to protect us. Uh, regarding the European integration, I go now the next week on 10th, I go to a conference in Hungary, that is one of these states uh, uh, more uh, um, linked with nationalism and populism at the moment in, in Europe. I'm not going to be very popular there with uh, my opinions, but still I will go there to, to speak. And uh, the point or my point is that the, with digitalization, we will make um, the European Union uh, much more uh, closer to the citizens. So let's say that at the moment we have this gap between the citizens and the European Union. With this gap, what it means that uh, many people just don't understand the European Union or don't care about the European Union because everything is in Brussels. They decide they're in Brussels. They don't understand how much this decision affects their lives. Okay, but this is also our work to promote the, and the, this understanding. But in my opinion, with this digitalization, uh, many services can be provided by the European Union. Or uh, many services are going to affect uh, the life of the citizens. E-health is one of the main examples. Okay, So now we have this uh, European uh, card of a uh, sanitary card. But if we have um, a real uh, e-health system, imagine the, the possibilities are endless and they are going to affect one of the most important things of the citizens, their health. Um, cues to wait. Maybe we have, uh, the, the, in Poland, uh, they have no cues for, um, I don't know, uh, leukemia. And in the uh, Czech Republic, they have huge cues. So we can divert all these people with, this, with the e-health uh, system in the European level. So we are going to provide much better system uh, service to the citizens, this is going to increase this uh, loyalty of the citizens. And this just uh, speaking about services from the digital approach. If we think about the uh, politics, even more, um, as I say, I always vote uh, online in the Estonian, I mean, I don't vote in the national elections, I vote here in the city hall uh, for Tallinn and in the European elections uh, in Estonia. I always vote online. Okay, so this increase the participation and also can increase the participation in the European elections if we try to implement these digital uh, reforms. So at the end, to make closer the institutions to the people, this will help to reduce this uh, nationalism that we are having nowadays. Thank you. Uh, some question from uh, from the audience. Uh, yes, let's try this way. 
try to formulate if uh, we can't uh, hear you or you move here. Yeah, you or uh, I will translate. I will uh, as you prefer. Can you hear something, David? Yeah, no, I hear you, but uh, nobody else. Just the student come here because we have only one fixed micro. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yep. Hi, uh, thank you for your interesting points and everything. I would um, really appreciate if we talked about more this e-governance and this sense of unity, politically speaking, in the European Union. Because we do mention that through digitalization and through this creation of let's say a common market, common services and so on and so forth, it would be, everything would be easier, right? And at the same time, I find that, uh, it's really challenging to imagine this in a, such a politi uh, political spectrum that we have at the moment. And so, yeah, I think, um, wouldn't it come as a counter argument to the more, again, to the point that we're mentioning, the more nationalist approach in each country and so on? So say me again, the, I mean, I more or less I understand, but what is the question itself? That is going to affect nationalism or? Yeah, it's more, how do you, how would you respond to this challenge on how to overcome it? And how would we have a new governance that supports both, uh, let's say the national identity of each country and at the same time? No. But the e governance will not support the national identity. National identity will be left as a cultural identity. But the thing that the, since the beginning, European Union has been trying to separate politics and the national aspects, but respecting nation as a cultural thing, not as a political uh, uh, necessity. So basically, rationality. We are not going to make policies according to the nation. We are going to make uh, policies according to the necessities of the citizens, not the nationals. So in that sense, the governance is going to uh, go much deeper in that. Uh, in that field, try to be a more rational uh, system with a more rational approach. Uh, again, the example I gave uh, right before about the e-health. If we will have a really coordinated system in the uh, European Union, we will reduce the queues uh, for getting a treatment much uh, more because now our systems, uh, sanitary systems are national. Yeah. We don't want that because we care about the health of the people. We don't care about the nationality. So this is the idea of this uh, e-governance, to be more efficient based on the concept of citizenship. There is not a European nationality. There is not a European nation. OK? Uh, you can feel European more or less, yes, but not as a nation. As a group of citizens, perhaps. We have this, I mean, I live in Estonia, I am uh, Spanish. My children are uh, half and half. Uh, my wife is half Swedish, half uh, Estonian. So I live in a very European, let's say, environment. But I don't believe in the idea of a European nation as a cultural group. I believe in the idea of uh, Europe as a community of different people that we have said a lot of history together and uh, we have a lot of similarities, but not as a nation. So in that sense, uh, e-governance is going to uh, make this difference uh, even bigger, just because being more rational. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. I have uh, a microphone that I can offer students. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, my question would be, um, we have been mentioning that in the European, the European Union uh, is really going um, for this kind of digitalization, not only of the economy, but also in many aspects of the of our daily lives. So <clears throat> my question would be, um, as the digitalization grows, uh, what also grows is the threats that may challenge the, the viability of the digitalization, for example, cyber threats, um, threats of cybersecurity, cyber hackers, for example. So my question would be, how is the European Union addressing this growing issue or how should it address it under your perspective? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, how is addressing it the uh, European Union with uh, ENISA, that is an uh, agency of the European Union that focuses on cybersecurity? It is located in, in Greece. 
I don't remember exactly now, I think in Athens, but I'm not 100% uh, sure. But it's the answer of the European Union for that. It's promoting this uh, cybersecurity uh, projects also in the um, different aspects in the academic world. So it's taking it very serious. It's one of the priorities of the European Union. I'm not an expert on cybersecurity at all, uh, but I know that the European Union is investing a lot of money on, on this aspect. So far, I think uh, they are working uh, yeah, good. And we take now into consideration, the, for example, the war of Ukraine. When we had this conflict between uh, Estonia and the and the Russia, with the strong soldier, as I said before, they say that Russia had the capacity to collapse the Estonian state for two days. Nowadays, uh, after the war of Ukraine, with all the I mean, uh, going uh, war of Ukraine, <coughs> I was reading it. Though, I don't know how many thousands of cyber attacks have been coming from uh, Russia. So, and they did not affect the economy of the European Union. They did not affect the services of the European Union. And especially think about the countries like Estonia that are highly um, involved in the digitalization. So a few years ago, they could collapse the Estonian state for two days. Nowadays, uh, they have not been affecting uh, almost anything. So in that sense, I think the European Union is uh, yeah, doing good. All, always everything can be improved. Okay, so it's not like uh, we have to just sleep in the happiness that we, we are safe. We are not safe, but uh, we are relatively safe. So I'm relatively positive about the answer of the European Union to that sense. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, regarding cyber attacks, a uh, couple of months ago here in Barcelona, the hospital clinic was uh, was attacked mm -hmm. for, for, for some weeks. Uh, couldn't uh, 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 get to normality and uh, I don't know the origin of the attacks I don't think it's from uh, is a consequence of the Russian war it's more a private group of hackers that uh, uh, look for after money and uh, last Digital summer, pirates. A part, yeah, absolutely and uh, a couple of summers ago the Universitat Autonom of Barcelona was uh, was uh, 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 had suffered suffer and cyber attack with Lots of uh, consequences. So all the Moodle's uh, campus were shut down. I mean, I mean, this uh, can have huge consequences on education and health, as you as you uh, 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 were mentioning. Yeah, I mean, the threats are there, and they, they are going to happen. It's impossible to have full protection. It's, it's always going to happen. But then, what we have to measure is: uh, are we more safe or less safe? That the, I mean. Digital uh, attacks in general, they get more publicity, but uh, there are other kind of analog attacks that uh, they are more uh, affecting more negatively, in my opinion. Yeah, a couple of questions more, and then uh, we will let you leave. Question, uh, comments, you can share uh, your experience as young uh, EU consumers. Uh, you were you, you were mentioning roaming, for example. No, uh, I'm thinking about my my position that is pretty similar to to your position. I'm, I'm an Italian uh, uh, national living uh, uh, in in Spain, going back in summer in in Italy, and roaming really changed uh, 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 my life and my <laughs> and my yeah. and my economy during during summer because I can. Uh, I can use my mobile connection uh, without any change. Uh, uh, and if you have kids or at least uh, you have family, this this will uh, will affect uh, a lot, and and will probably change also. No, the 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 behavior or the 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 the, the, the feeling of belongingness to, to to the European Union. If uh, we exactly. we notice that the European Union is getting closer to us, do we have a question more? No? Okay, so uh, David, I'm very congratulations first. Many thanks for uh, sharing your uh, time uh, and your knowledge uh, with uh, with us. It was uh, it has been a pleasure uh, because we could uh, widen a little bit the perspective of uh, of our course that uh, is not a, 
a course on uh, on the, uh, uh, not even the, the the common market nor uh, the digital uh, market, but you 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 really help us uh, to 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 include this uh, this uh, uh, issue in uh, in our context. So congratulations, many thanks, and uh, good luck for uh, for everything. Thank you. The same for you, and uh, thank to all of you for for listening. I hope thank you. you. Thank Bye. you so much. Have a great.